I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. This episode has been sponsored by Bookhampton. As the premier independent bookstore in the Hamptons, Bookhampton has a highly curated selection of books for readers of all ages, unique one-of-a-kind gifts, and exciting author events. Browse their fabulous staff suggestions online at bookhampton.com. I'm really excited to be talking to Delia Owens. Delia Owens' novel, Where the Crawdads Sing, was Reese's book club pick in September and is now a best-selling novel. She is the co-author of three internationally best-selling nonfiction books as well about her life as a wildlife scientist. A winner of the John Burroughs Award for Nature Writing, Delia has been published in Nature, the African Journal of Ecology, and others. She received a Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Georgia and got her PhD in animal behavior from UC Davis. She wrote Cry of the Kalahari about her years living in the African wild, studying lions and hyenas, along with Mark Owens. Uh, She also co-wrote The Eye of the Elephant and Secrets of the Savannah about her years studying elephants. After 23 years of living in Africa, followed by her time in the Rockies, she currently lives in Idaho with her husband and many elk, deer, and moose. Hi, Delia. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. I can't believe your book has been on the New York Times bestseller list for like 11 weeks now. Is that right? That's crazy. Uh, 12 weeks. 12 (laughs) weeks. Oh, my gosh. Congratulations. Thank you. It's very exciting. Oh, uh, now, sorry. I have to ask you. I have to ask you something. Okay, I'm I'm new to Instagram, but is this the same people I talk to? I've been communicating on Instagram. Yes. Or not? Yes. Yes. yes it's me. Okay. okay. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I've been, I've been seeing your your moms don't have time to read books. Yeah. So thank you for all of that. Of course. Um, yeah. No, I've been reading your book, and you know, I like to snap pictures while I read, and yeah, that's me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. <laughs> So thanks for writing back. That always gives me such a thrill. (laughs) Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me on the podcast. This is fun. Sure. So you are this amazingly accomplished animal and wildlife researcher. You're like a modern day Jane Goodall. (laughs) (laughs) You spent 23 years living in Africa. Is that right? Observing and writing about all sorts of animals? That's true. Yes. I, I spent 23 years, yes. And now you've just tried your hand at fiction, and look what happened. It's this amazingly (laughs) incredible, beautiful novel. So how did you do it? Like, how did you decide to write a novel? And literally, how did you do it? Did you take a class? Did you read about it? Or did you just try? I read books. I read novels. I didn't find the transition hard at all. Our nonfiction books that I co-authored, they were written in story fashion in a way. They had a beginning, middle, and end. And But writing, I, I describe it this way. I like to ride horses a lot. And I live in northern Idaho, and I can take my horse and just ride anywhere. And writing nonfiction, the other books, are sort of like riding a horse inside of a corral. You know, there's a big fence. There's a timeline. You have to, the timeline has to be accurate. The characters have to be real. You might want to change this or that, but you can't because it's nonfiction. Mm-hmm. But when you write fiction, it's like taking your horse and just, you know, clicking him and going as fast as you want across the meadow, up the mountains. There was a freedom mm-hmm. to writing fiction. My imagination just went a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I found it a lot of fun. I found it inspirational. And how did you, how did you come up with this story? Well, that was also from my experiences in Africa. I lived a very isolated life, and so I was very curious about how isolation affects a person. I wanted to write a novel about that. But also, as I was observing the lions, I'd go out every afternoon, late in the afternoon, and follow the lions through the night. And, you know, I began to realize that the animals I studied, the pride of lions, the herd of elephants, the pack of hyenas, those Tightly bonded groups are not made up of both sexes. They're made up only of females. The males come and go for breeding and mating purposes, but the females are the ones that that form these tightly bonded groups that last for all of their lives. And I had had close girlfriends when I was at home, and suddenly I I didn't have a group. And I, I realized the importance of, of having a group. And I wanted to write a story that would tell and show and make people feel what it's like when you don't have a group and how it affects your behavior. Yeah, you wrote this great line you had Mabel tell Kaya in the book. Uh, 
you need some girlfriends, hun, because they're forever without a vow. That, a, a clutch of women's right, the most tender, right. most tough place on earth. <laughs> that's that's true. It's true. Girlfriends are so essential. They are, and they and you know we have a very strong genetic propensity. It's not just that we like to be with girls. It's all of our ancestors, all, all primates live in this type of society with a group of females, the troop of baboons. And so we have the genetic propensity for that. It's not just something we thought up on our own. It's very strongly written in our genes. And we feel it deeply when we're isolated from that type of group. And what amazed me was when I came back from Africa, after living in remote settings, I'd come back and visit my friends in the cities and find out that some of them in today's world felt just as isolated as I did. Mm. They might mm-hmm. live in a city with a million people, but they didn't have that strong group anymore, the kind that I had when I was growing up. So I think a lot of people experience loneliness and abandonment and rejection. And so I felt that that was a story that a lot of people might be interested in reading is how to deal with this. Absolutely. I guess you're right, huh? <laughs> <laughs> I'm feeling now like I should be making more time for girls' dinners than I have been. I feel like as a mom, one of the first things I cut out is like, well, I I don't have time to see my girlfriends. I'll, you know, I'll do that another time. I have to be with my kids or this or that or working or or something. But I I feel like you've just given me an excuse to to do what I want with my friends. (laughs) Well, it's not just fun. It's very important. It's very important for the companionship. Our ancestors survived because they had a group. You know, single mom in the wilderness of Africa it doesn't last as long as a group. Hmm. With, and so the best, the best of all cases is to be with your girlfriends and the children all together. I mean, that's what's normal. Right. That makes sense. So you had this, you (laughs) had the, yeah, bring the kids. (laughs) So you had this revelation, you know, connecting women's friendships in the wild and you wanted to talk about that in a novel. And yet you came up with this amazing storyline with different characters and drama and courthouse scenes. And how did you get from step one to step two? Like, how did how did you make that happen? I was determined to write something that would be very readable and exciting. I, I'm terrified of boring the reader. I, I don't want the reader to be bored. So I knew there had to be a lot of things happening. And I actually came up with the ending. I, I don't remember where I was or how, but I came up to that with that ending, and I thought, wow, I have to write a book that fits the ending. Interesting. <laughs> so I, I didn't start there literally and write backwards, but I knew how I wanted it to end, and then I started in the beginning and, 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 and began writing a story with the different characters together that could lead to that ending. And I wanted to have a mystery that would have clues. The clues are hidden in all sorts of strange places within the story. And I wanted to bring that part into it, a mystery that someone could solve. The the clues are there. If you go back and read it, I've had readers go back and read it the second time and they say, I can't believe how you just told us everything. The clues are there, but they're, they're, they're hidden and they don't see them sometimes until the end. Yeah, I was tempted to reread it. I was literally like sitting there next to my husband and I kept grabbing him. I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what's happening. Oh my gosh, you'll never believe the outcome. <laughs> I couldn't believe I it. Promise, so. if, you, if you go back and read it again, you will find that the clues are there. And the way you write is so vivid and expressive. It's truly unique, the the way, the analogies even that you use. This one time you wrote, when you were talking about Kaya venturing into town to go grocery shopping, you say, mostly the village seemed tired of arguing with the elements and simply sagged. And that was after all the other ways you described the village. And I thought that simple sentence was so perfect, right? It just like captured everything you wanted to say about that town. The reader instantly knows <laughs> what you're talking about and you can see it in your head. Have you always been able to just write so lyrically? Does it something that comes naturally to you or something you've had to practice? I, I, well, I tried to write nonfiction that way as well. And I think I did to a certain extent. It's more limited when you write nonfiction, but I love that type of writing. And you have to be careful because I don't think, as a reader, I don't like to read too much description. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like putting too much sugar in your coffee or your tea. 
you, you don't want, you, there's a, a fine line. You ju- I just don't like a book that has too much description. It's getting the right words, not a lot of words, but the right words. And so I worked on that, and it, it, it took me years to write this book because I didn't just sit down and write it in one go. I worked on it on and off. And over the years, I found myself improving, I think, getting better at writing description. It's, I love that part of it. How long did it take to write? Well, I, I'm embarrassed to say this. No, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> well, I worked on it for uh, 10 years, but I had another job. I mean, I, I, I was back from Africa, and I was, but I still have a project going on in Africa, I was doing fundraising and doing conservation work here in the United States. So I had a day job, and again, living in the wilderness, but it was a job. And so I would get up at 4.30 every morning to write on this book. And then I would get discouraged after a year or so, and I'd put it away. Sometimes I put it away for a couple of years. So it's not (laughs) like I was working on it for 10 years, but over a period of 10 years, I worked on it. And I actually think putting it away and letting it rest, so to speak, helped. Because then you go back to, when I go back to it, I I think I I was a better judge of what was actually working and what wasn't working. And then you finished writing your book and sent it out, and tell me what happened next. Uh, Well, oh gosh, really? (laughs) Yeah, I want to know. Do you mind? If you mind, I can, I'm curious. Well, well, I'd published three, co-authored three uh, nonfiction books, so I thought, well, I'll just send it to those people. Well, it's taken me so long to get this one written that, honestly, most of those people were retired and moved <laughs> on. And so I found myself in that cold world of not having an agent or a publisher. And then I sent so I sent it out to some of the, the agents that I'd had. I sent it out to the agent that I'd had for my very first book, a wonderful man named Peter Matson. And he said, he said, I love this story. He said, I'm not going to um, be the one to represent this to publishers because I'm almost retired, but I'd love to help you edit it. And he took, he took many, many months to help edit it for me. And he said, okay, now it's ready to send it out. And I just thought that was beautiful for him to come back and help me knowing he was not going to be involved with the publication of it. That's amazing. And so from then, like everybody else, I got the writer's market off the shelf and started sending it cold calls to other agents. And within a few days, I got a great agent, Russell Galen, and he came back and he said, okay, this is it. We're going. (laughs) And he sent it out. I got five publishers who wanted to publish it. And so from then, it was just it was just wonderful. You know, it happened pretty fast, but it had been very slow up to that point. <laughs> <laughs> and then next thing you know, it's come out, and Reese Witherspoon picks it as her you know book club pick. Right. What, how did you respond to that? Do you did you know who Reese Witherspoon was? Like, do you watch TV? I, I knew who she was as an actress. I do not watch TV. I haven't seen that TV program that. Apparently, he's doing great. It's a great show. I haven't, but I, I've seen. I knew her as an actress, and I didn't even really know she had a book club. But then I, once my book came out, I started paying attention to things like that. So I did know that she had it. And my editor called me one day, and I have to say that my editor, my, all, Putnam has just been the greatest publishing house to work with. I just have such a great relationship with them. And my editor called to say that Reese had had chosen my book for the September book of the month. Did you get out the champagne? <laughs> oh, yes, I did. And, uh, I re- and seriously, the next week, I was on the bestseller list. <laughs> wow. It's amazing. Yeah, so it meant so much to me. I was so thrilled. I just feel so grateful. I'm Obviously, I'm excited and happy about how well the book is being received, but I also just feel so grateful that so many people have helped to make this happen. You don't do it by yourself. And I feel like being an author today, you you have to do a fair amount of sort of self-promotion, right? Like you have to be willing to hit the road and go and do the tours and post on, be on social media and all that. Are you comfortable with all of that? Oh my gosh. I thought that, I just refused at first to go on social media. I'd never been on social media. I had no idea what it was, how to do it. And they, they kept encouraging me. I won't say they forced me. <laughs> <But>. <laughs> Oh, and so I tried it, and I can understand why people like it because you have this 
instant connection with people who've read the book. And I don't have time to do a lot of it. I still don't understand most of it. I know that probably half the things I put on there end up somewhere else. I don't know. But <laughs> it, it's been very fun to connect with people who are reading the book. And it's been I, that part I've enjoyed. I have to say, and I, I know we spoke briefly about this at the start, but when I... Like to have the ability to say that you're reading someone's book and have that actual author write you and be like, hey, I'm so glad you're reading my book. For me as a reader, like that is just the coolest thing. Every time that happens with any author, it just, I, I get such a thrill. I just, I'm sure other readers feel the same way. And it's nice to hear how it is from the author side as well. I get the same feeling. It's a thrill. And I love sometimes when you'll see a discussion going on between two readers, you know, well, about what they thought of the ending. Or what the, and, you know, and you come in and say, and you could come in and put your two cents <laughs> in. <laughs> That's amazing. And no one can argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> you also, you incorporated a lot of poetry. Uh, are you a big fan of poetry? I, some of the poems, let me just read one or two. If you wrote this Galway Canal poem from Ma's book that Kaya finds, and it says, I have to say, I'm relieved it's over. At the end, I could only feel pity for that urge toward more life. Goodbye. And then you have the Amanda Hamilton, many, many poems, but the one that she first yeah. reads, uh, Trapped inside, love is a caged beast, eating its own flesh. Love must be free to wander, to land upon its chosen shore and breathe. So tell me about your relationship to poetry. Are you a, a big fan? Do you like to write poetry yourself? I do. I, I've written poetry all my life. I'm not saying I'm good at it at all, but I find it, it words just come to my mind a lot, and I, and I feel a lot when I write poetry. And I feel that it can the words themselves can be so inspiring to readers. Most people who love good prose and literature, even if they don't have time or the inclination to read poetry, I think when they do read a verse, they feel a lot. Mm-hmm. That was the number one thing I wanted about this book is I wanted people to feel. And I think poetry makes you feel, and you can say, you can get your thoughts into a few words, and you can do it in a way that it's like putting a drug straight into your bloodstream. Mm -hmm. You have to read a whole novel sometimes to feel certain things and, and get the point, but a poem can say so much in a few words, and I think that's the reason it's so powerful. This is great. You you, you speak the way you write. You speak just as beautifully with so many, no, you have so many analogies and ways for me to conjure up, like, visually what you're saying. It's perfect. It's great. <laughs> Oh, you, thank no, you. I you don't do, feel that way, but no, it's true. You do the same. Your website too. I was like, I felt like I like didn't want to stop reading your website, whereas usually it's just you know, very functional copy. Yours was you even gave away like the first two chapters or parts of them on your website, which I thought was really unusual but really great. Well, thank you. Yeah, I'm. I was new at all that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> So you've had this amazing success. I'm sure you're just like riding the wave for a while. Do you have ambitions to write another book? Do you feel like you finally checked this off your list? How do you feel about about writing books at this point? Oh, I definitely, I've started another one. I have an idea for another one. I want to continue where the crawdads sing is a, it's a, it's a socio-biological drama. <clears throat> it's a, a drama, a story, a thriller, a murder mystery, a love story, but also, it asks some very serious questions about why humans behave the way we do. Mm-hmm. That is the central theme. And I want to continue with that theme. I want to write another book that's also a, a drama and a love story, and I don't know if there'll be a, what, some sort of mystery, some sort of compelling story, but with some serious questions. And so I, I have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed that right now there's so much going on with this book, which I'm thrilled about, but it's a little bit hard to sit down and, and, and get into the zone of writing, which I'm lucky I can find that zone and get into that zone, but it's a little bit difficult right now. But I'm, I'm trying not to be too hard on myself. You know, I should give myself some time to enjoy this book, but I am working on the second one. Oh, that's exciting. I think you definitely owe yourself a little time to kick back and and soak it up. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. (laughs) 
So for aspiring writers out there, and I know we talked a little about your transition to fiction, but what advice would you give? What if there's someone out there who also has just an ending in mind the way you did? What would you say to those people? What advice about the whole road to publication and writing and everything? The most important thing is that you have to believe. Um, Everyone will tell you how difficult it is, and it is difficult. The writing is difficult. The whole process is difficult than getting someone to read it. And, you know, never mind finding an agent, it's getting an agent to read it because there's so many manuscripts that that fall on their desk every day. So you have to believe in it and you have to really work at it. You know, get up 4.30 every morning and work on it and just, and it just takes a huge amount of work. But you can't let that stress interfere with your creative. It's the, it's being creative that visually connects with another person. Mm -hmm. You know, words don't necessarily connect. It's the creative words, the words that speak to someone. And it's real important to try to get to that place within your own heart that you feel like that you you have this that you want to say and you want somebody to listen. And when you start feeling that, I, when I wrote, it was almost like I had the reader sitting in the chair next to me. And I was always saying, okay, I do not want to bore the reader. I don't want to confuse the reader. I'm very, very conscious of the reader when I write. And I think that's sort of a a cue to, for, for people to keep in mind. Don't forget the reader. Absolutely. That's my advice. That's good advice. <laughs> <laughs> so are, are you involved? I'm sure this is going to be a movie. Is there... What what can you say about that? Nothing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm sorry. I, can I just say thought nothing. I'd try. I just thought you never know. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was so nice chatting with you. I loved your book and was so just transported into the whole marshland and all the characters. And um, I feel like it gave me this whole other experience as a, you know, as I'm living here in the middle of Manhattan in New York City and just uh, to be able to escape just by opening a book into the, the world that you painted for me was was a real treat. So thank you for that. Well, thank you, Siri. It's been so nice to, to meet you on Instagram. I never thought I'd say that to anybody, but it's <laughs> been so fun. And, <laughs> and it's so nice to talk to you now. I really appreciate your support and you enthusiasm. Oh, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Okay, bye-bye. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. This episode has been sponsored by Bookhampton, bookhampton.com. Thanks to Ryan and Steve at Texture Sound for the audio editing and mixing. Thanks for listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you.